Hi guys, it is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous, I do mean beautiful day, here in the collapse of global industrial civilization, here in the great state of Texas. It is a Wednesday, it is January 25th, 2023, so guys, I am uh, winding down my time in the great state of Texas and I'm going to be heading to Mexico in a couple of days and have to be figuring out what that means for Collapse Chronicles. I will have a couple of announcements about what I'm going to be doing with this channel for the next few weeks, but since we have one more normal day, one more normal day <laughs> on Collapse Chronicles, you will be absolutely shocked to hear what I am going to do with my last full Chronicle of the Collapse. And we're going to go over to the bottomless pit of Doomer porn called Medium.com. And I think I just did a, a uh, rant by this, I believe, I don't know, man or woman simply named B. B is in uh, B is in B, a critic of modern times, offering ideas for honest contemplation. And so this uh, essay is a couple of months old now, with uh, the straight-ahead, correct headline: Malthus was right. He most certainly was. So, uh, as a introduction to this uh, rant, I might, uh, is th this is the opening salvo. This is a long involved rant. I will put the uh, link on to anybody who wants to uh, go read it for themselves. But I will be glad to sit here and read it for you. We are having a serious overshoot problem in the fact that most of us don't recognize it as our biggest issue won't make it disappear or contract in size. Well, neither will the people who realize, who do realize it's our biggest issue. Anyway, in essence, we use more natural resources every year than what gets replenished by nature and pollute more and what the living world can absorb. Fresh water, wood, fish, wildlife, the signs are everywhere. Extinct species dying at a rate a hundred times above the normal background rate, ecosystems collapsing like the Amazon rainforest failing to provide not only a habitat for many species, but the very rainfall upon which local agriculture depends. How did we get here, and how do we get out? And who was this Malthus anyway? So guys, obviously this for anybody who's been down here in the rabbit hole for more than 10 minutes, uh, this will be kind of uh, the ABCs of, uh, of doom. <clears throat> Earth Overshoot Day gives a brutally honest picture about our sustainability, or in fact lack of it, by showing us the date till when we have used up all natural resources for that given year and started living up, started, started to live up the future. This year, well last year now, in 2022, Earth Overshoot Day fell on July 28th. I'm going to predict that Earth Overshoot Day will fall on July 10th of this year. Remember that prediction. <clears throat> July 28th, 2022 is the date when we stopped living off the interest, the annual surplus, which can be harvested every year without jeopardizing the future, and turn to live up the savings account instead. 
As for a clue on how this manifests itself in the living world around us, you don't have to look farther than the Living Planet Index, which of course I call the Dying Planet Index. I had several uh, rants about the Dying Planet Index from uh, a few months ago. You can see for yourself how eerily overshoot day correlates with the trend in declining wildlife populations, including insects, mammals, birds, etc. <coughs> this is no autocorrelation or conspiracy. Humans use up Earth's resources faster and faster than they could regenerate every year. Thus, rather consequently, there is less and less left for our animal cousins. If you add climate change, pesticide use, agricultural runoff, industrial pollution, <clears throat> you have a perfect trend pointing towards zero. Now the one now the question presents itself how did we get here and how do we get out and I'm just going to interject here I was asking this exact question to this ecologist named William Reese uh, in an interview I had and I will be uh, probably reposting that interview with William Reese in a couple of days and you can hear him answer the question, how did we get here and how do we get out and compare it with B's analysis of the situation, which is this. The story begins tens of thousands of years ago. Well before the age of widespread agriculture, humans had to live on what they could find and hunt down in the wilderness. Each area could feed and clothe only a certain amount of humans. In other words, each area had a different but very much limited carrying capacity of humans equaling the largest possible stable population of Homo sapiens the said ecosystem could support. Say one to ten persons per square kilometer. Should our ancestors have had more babies than what their given area could support or the available food in that region had been reduced due to whatever region, they had a problem to be solved. They could choose from several options, however, and I was having this very discussion with a friend last night. Option number one, walk away. This was the easiest method. Look for food elsewhere. Expand the hunting territory. Move the entire group into new, previously uninhabited lands. It's not hard to see how two-legged hominids walking on the face of the planet in search for new habitats and more food ended up even in the remotest of areas. There were two caveats though. One, Earth was and still is a sphere with a finite surface area and two, our ancestors always found someone or something already living in the desired land happily using all of the available biological productivity in that area already. Consequently, it was inevitable to apply option two as a next step upon arrival. And so this, you know, option one is obviously now what uh, immigration, what migration meaning emigration or immigration, uh, depending on what side of the fence you're on, is all about. It is people, what migrants are doing, uh, they are exercise, exercising option one. They are walking away to find food or a better life somewhere else. Unfortunately, when they get to where they're already going, 
such as the great state of Texas, they will find a bunch of people already here in the great state of Texas. And uh, so this whole immigration thing is just uh, the modern version of option one, walk away, which brings us to uh, option number two, take it from others. This method, what William Catton, author of Overshoot, calls takeover, involve taking food or habitat from other species. After, or I would add by other species, other humans who are living there call a resource war. Uh, so I guess other species or other humans who got there first. After earning the title of being the fire apes, humans have started to alter their environment by intentionally burning down entire forests to make good grazing and, and hunting grounds for large herds of tasty mammals. They took the land from forests, birds, insects, and many other species, drove them out, and turned more sunlight the ultimate source of all biological productivity to their favor. They've also planted fruit orchards, nut trees, and shrubs, inventing agroforestry tens of thousands of years before the term was coined and well before the official advent of real agriculture. So that was option number two. Then option number three is the one that we've pretty much been exercising uh, at least over the last 10,000 years. Live up your heritage. Why bother with sustainability when we have an abundance of food and enough able-bodied men and women to hunt it all down? The question presented itself. There was indeed a much quicker way to success the drawdown of rich resources, which drawdown is the, you know, one of the major components of overshoot. Mammoth hunting was a prime example of drawdown. Herds of mammoths, once counting thousands of animals, were all hunted to extinction as humans took far more than what could be naturally regenerated. It is needless to say how this method quickly led to extinctions and not only to our praise, but many of our own ancestors as well. Yes, it did. Now there is a fourth option which is not uh, mentioned here, which is infanticide. Uh, we will not get into the dicey subject of infanticide. You can uh, Google infanticide on your own. But anyway, since B does not even talk about the other method, we will move on. <clears throat> As you can see from the examples above, the question of inadvertently overshooting a given area's carrying capacity or taking more than what could be provided indefinitely was always a risk we ran, but we have also developed coping mechanisms to deal with it, at least temporarily. Humans were never as sustainable as we would like to think. Yes, the, this whole bullshit notion of humans living in harmony and balance with Mother Nature. Uh, uh, William Reese touches on that subject, and I should have gotten him to expand upon it, that the entire notion of the balance of nature is a myth. There is no nature inherently is out of balance, and humans are the most out of balance. Uh, it, it, anyway, that's another rant for another day. Humans were never 
as sustainable as we would like to think. The myth of the noble savage. It increasingly looks like that we were the reason behind driving most large mammals and birds to extinction by simply overhunting them, but there is no way of telling how many other species we have sent to the pages of history books by burning their forests to the ground. Most of the tribes, you know, the noble savages, who experienced bottlenecks though had learned it the hard way how to live within their limits, can you say infanticide, but they did so only after running into a dangerously intimate relationship with extinction. However, after a balance was struck, human life could be sustained within the limits of a given area's carrying capacity for a very, very long time, as the current example of many indigenous people around the world shows. Uh, anyway, we won't get off on that red herring. Okay. Jumping a few thousand years ahead, into the once stable climate of the Holocene, we see people developing agricultural practices. No matter how instant we would like to see this revolution happening, agriculture was in fact only a hobby for, uh, for most people. Play farming, as authors of The Dawn of Everything like to call it. Farming on the fertile riverbanks was a sideline activity to fishing and hunting even after the appearance of the first permanent settlements. For several thousands of years, people maintained both methods, but the balance was slowly tipped in favor of farming. An increasingly sophisticated method for taking over habitats and turning them into lands feeding nobody but us. Beyond a certain population size and density, however, there was no other way to feed large crowds and keep them under tight control. There we go, there's one for the conspiracy theorists. <clears throat> Empires, kingdoms, and other civilizations have come about as a result and perhaps not always by popular demand. After several cycles of rise and fall of various empires around the world, small kingdoms in Western Asia, also known as Europe, started to have serious problems. <clears throat> they have kept increasing their agricultural productivity, in other words, pushing their land's carrying capacity well beyond its original value, but this method too had its own limitations. After experiencing several population crashes, due to malnutrition, overcrowded cities, and as a result, diseases like the Black Death, something had to be done. There were simply too many people and too little land left to feed them. What could be done? Let's see. Should we walk away from these overcrowded lands? There are unfriendly folks all over the place. Hmm. Why don't we embark a ship instead and visit far away places on the other side of the world? That looks like a good idea. Uh-oh, someone is living here already and telling us it's their land. Oops. So let us encourage them to leave their most fertile lands, then ask them and other nice folks to kindly work for us for free, of course. That should work. 
so did the biggest takeover in human history begin, the takeover of Turtle Island as the, as the noble savages of America had referred to their land. The takeover of carefully managed ecosystems and their turning into monoculture crops the takeover of human labor enslaving large numbers of Africans to work on the newly established plantations. Colonies they're talking about, obviously, the American colonies here. Colonies grew like mushrooms exploding into newly discovered lands, crowding out indigenous people while crowding out the first invaders, you know. There is no, there were, there, the Western Hemisphere has no indigenous people. We were the next wave of invaders driving out the original wave of invaders who had already driven how many of our fellow earthlings to extinction before the honky wave ever got here anyway. I won't get off on a noble savage rant. Anyway, okay, crowding out the original invaders, destroying their culture and way of life in the process. The exodus from Europe, combined with the food imported from the colonies, solved the population problem in the old world, but only for a while. Slowly but steadily, humans have occupied the entire planet and took lands not only from other nations, but from forests, swamps, marshes, and other habitats, forcing their inhabitants to leave and look for a living elsewhere. But it was not enough. By the end of the 18th century, people were still starving in many places. What to do? Global population hit one billion people. We could not just walk away anymore. The entire planet ate with one billion people. The entire planet was full of humans. We were already super busy taking over what we could from others or other species for centuries now. It was the end of the takeover method. All right, so now we have a long quote uh, from a book. It would be real nice if B told who he or she was quoting, but anyway. In his 1798 book, An Essay on the Principle of Population, Malthus observed that an increase in a nation's food production improved the well-being of the population, but the improvement was temporary because it led to population growth, which in turn re restored the original per capita production level. In other words, humans had a propensity to utilize abundance for population growth rather than for maintaining a high standard of living. Populations had a tendency to grow until the lower class suffered hardship, want, and greater susceptibility to famine and disease. Back to B. There was no evil logic behind this observation, just basic math coming from the recognition, which should be rather obvious by now, that there is no infinite growth on a finite planet. Putting a sticker Malthusian on such an observation, however, does not invalidate the simple truth. You know, obviously, uh, many people in the comments section on my soft white underbelly 
uh, you know, pointed out I was a clueless moron Malthusian that uh, Malthus has been proven uh, to be incorrect. Which more people who are even aware of Malthus, you understand that a hell of a lot more people who are even vaguely aware of Malthus think he was wrong. A tiny few of us understand that Malthus, uh, the one of the original doomers, was spot on. By the beginning of the 20th century, there were simply not enough nutrients in the soil to feed this many of us. It's when we were around 2 billion. Drawdown began at scale. Mountains of guano, bird and bat manure, was mined a way to improve soil fertility and to prevent humanity as a whole experiencing a bottleneck, but it still was not enough. Then along came Norman B Borlaug and the Haber-Bosch process to the rescue, starting the so-called Green Revolution. Man-made fertilizers and crops selected to take up as much nitrogen as possible have boosted yields beyond imagination. Make no mistake, though, this was not human ingenuity at its best. This was humanity's good old friend in dire need again, drawdown. That here we go again with drawdown. Turbocharged by fossil fuels, meaning, you know, as We've had this rant many times that uh, the Green Revolution, particularly the Haber-Bosch process, is 100% dependent on fossil fuels. And if we just stop fossil fuels, about half the population would be dead within the first growing season which is why the main reason I am a champion of just stopping fossil fuels. Uh, turbocharged by fossil fuels, the green revolution has only bought us time, nothing more. It, meaning the green revolution, that everybody points to, you know, talking about why Malthus and Paul Ehrlich and anybody believing Malthus or Paul Ehrlich is wrong. Uh, it has only bought us time, nothing more. It was based on the one-time drawdown of fossil fuels via well, not only the fertilizers, via diesel-powered machinery and natural gas-derived fertilizer boosted with one-time minerals like potash, all turned into more food and contrary to many prior warnings, more people. And then we have another quote from uh, somebody you have to click on to find the source of this. So the mysterious quote, humans have mistaken drawed in this. It wouldn't surprise me if this wasn't William Catton uh, from Overshoot is my guess where this quote is coming from. Quote, humans have mistaken draw down for take over and a temporary increase in carrying capacity for a permanent increase. This is why people speak of producing fossil fuels when extracting fossil fuels is a more accurate description of what's happening. Back to B. Was it wise then to build an entire civilization on a knowingly finite reserve of mineral heritage, especially knowing that it will heat up the planet when used? 
Was it wise to let populations around the world grow in a runaway style, literally consuming all natural resources and eating up their own future? Okay, maybe not, but we will find something. Sure, the thing we have failed to understand so far is that technology did not ever stop drawdown. Technology has only accelerated drawdown and created progress traps. Instead of using a pickaxe to mine metal ores and coal for an occasional tool or sword, for example, we now use immense machinery powered by finite reserves of coal and oil to mine what seemed to be bare rock for our ancestors to uphold the life support systems most of us depend on. We have missed the fact that we are now walking up against a landslide trying to work against a Ponzi scheme of truly epic proportions. We are forced to commit ever larger amounts of energy, materials, and labor just to stay in place as mineral deposits deplete, however, they require an exponential increase in energy and material input. The very things we get from finite mineral deposits just as prone to depletion as anything else. Yes, I know, we will switch to solar, nuclear, hydrogen, or fusion, sure, all made from non-renewable, one-time, finite mineral resources. What could possibly go wrong? Thank you. Amen, brother or sister B. And I noticed a lot of that uh, could have been that uh, interview uh, with William Reese that I had, which I'll be talking about more tomorrow when I will be announcing uh, kind of what Collapse Chronicles will probably be looking like uh, for the next few weeks while I get out there and enjoy uh, taking a jet airplane to Cancun while I still can. I highly suggest you get out there and take a jet plane to Cancun while you still can. Are you saying bye to the folks? Bye, guys. So tomorrow will be the last time you see Sancho Panza for weeks. So come back, say goodbye to Sancho Panza tomorrow until March. Bye, guys.